Great. Take All right, away, awesome. Haley. Okay, thanks, Tim. So hello, everybody. My name is Haley Marzoff. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about my summer graduate, uh, graduate school work, planning for the future of urban prairies. So for this project, I've been researching adaptive management practices uh, to develop a conservation plan for the Urban Ecology Center. So just a little outline for my plan today, I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of background about myself and why I've been doing this work. Um, I'll explain what our project was, uh, go into what adaptive management is, and finally, I'm going to explain our project methods or how we developed this adaptive management plan. So let's get started. So a little bit of background on me and why I'm doing this. Um, like Tim mentioned, I've been at the Urban Ecology Center for about three years. Um, actually, today is my three-year anniversary, so exactly three years. Um, and I started as an environmental educator at the Menominee Valley branch. And currently, I'm the animal care specialist at all three branches. Um, so when the COVID-19 pandemic first closed everything down and really stopped in-person teaching, um, I decided it was time for me to go back to school full time. So I applied to the Environmental Conservation Master's Program, which is through the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies at UW-Madison, um, and I got in. So I knew that I wanted to change my focus from focusing on education to having a lot more direct involvement in the implementation of conservation work in Wisconsin. <clears throat> so this coursework uh, introduced me to the process of conservation planning which is what I've been focusing on this summer with the UEC. Um, this program also required a summer project where the students partner with an organization to apply their learning and create some kind of deliverable product. Um, so this presentation is gonna be a summary of my summer project and the research that we've all been doing. So how did I apply my graduate school work for my summer project? Um, well, like I said, I knew I wanted to use conservation planning principles so I spoke with the Ecology Circle, which it's a working circle within the Urban Ecology Center that consists of staff from the Research and Community Science Department, which you're all very familiar with. Um, and some of you might be familiar with the Land Stewardship Department. Um, additionally, we included some local experts and other staff members um, just to get some more input, more broad ideas. <clears throat> so this was a newly formed group by, um, of UEC staff and the purpose was really to facilitate interdepartmental communication, and we wanted to determine uh, ways to measure ecological indicators to ensure that we're really maximizing the, the animal and the plant diversity on the land that we manage. Um, and this land is really constrained, it's densely used urban spaces, um, so we needed to keep all that in mind as well. <clears throat> so I spoke with the, with the Ecology Circle group, and they agreed to let me lead the planning process. So throughout this summer, uh, that's what we've been working on. We've been creating this adaptive management plan um, and trying to align the work of these two, to these two departments of the UEC. So what is adaptive management? Um, basically, it's a systematic approach for improving natural resource management outcomes in the face of uncertainty. Um, there I have a bit more of a technical de definition by one of the kind of founding people of adaptive management framework. Um, his name's Nick Solovsky. Um, and his definition just says that it's a really structured approach to environmental decision making that incorporates research into conservation action by integrating design, management, and monitoring, all as a way to systematically test assumptions and continuously learn and adapt, like I said, in the face of uncertainty. So now uh, thinking about why this approach would be so useful for the Urban Ecology Center or why do we need to start thinking in terms of adaptive management? Um, so there's a few main reasons. First of all, the Urban Ecology Center is located in an urban context. Uh, the three branches are all right in the middle of the city of Milwaukee. And this really requires the ability to quickly adapt to any changes in order to protect the land from the urban pressures that are constantly changing around us. So things like new construction projects that are destroying habitat, uh, the heat island effect, increasing our temperatures, increasing pollution levels. These are all things that we really need to think about when we're thinking about how to plan for um, the Urban Ecology Center land. Secondly, climate change is another really unpredictable factor at play here. Um, above is just a picture of Lake Michigan, right? And that's um, our state's eastern boundary, as you guys all know, I'm sure. 
And in the future, we're going to see a lot of changes with, with our lake, right? We're going to see increasing water levels or sometimes decreasing water levels. We're going to see um, changing temperatures, changing weather patterns. Um, so climate change is something that needs to be on the forefront of our minds here in this planning process. Um, additionally, having a well-designed system and plan can, can really help funders uh, be attracted to our work, right? Uh, they want to know what the results of their donations are going to be. Um, ecological restoration is a really slow process. A lot of plants take years before they become established and they really show us those desired results that we want to see and those complete ecosystems. Um, but with a plan that's laid out for how we believe this is going to happen, we can show our donors how actions are really making a difference to the land and the community, even if they're not completed yet. So we can really track our results and show the progress that we've made so far. Um, and then finally, uh, much of the UEC managed land is on post-industrial sites. So for example, uh, Three Bridges Park used to be the biggest brownfield in the state. So very degraded, very contaminated land. And restoration projects on this type of land are not super common yet, and they're also not extensively studied. So if we're starting to gather this data um, and this information, we could use that in the future for inspiring other projects around the country. Um, and future teams will have kind of a baseline to work off of. Off of. So how did we do all of this? Uh, well, we used a framework that's called the Open Standards for the Practice of Conservation to create our plan. And this is often shortened to just the conservation standards or the open standards. So if you hear me use one of those phrases, uh, we're talking about the same thing. Um, and the conservation standards were developed by a group called the Conservation Measures Partnership, which is just a bunch of, a bunch of conservation professionals who uh, wanted to put all their brain power together to improve the practice of conservation and, and really make it easier to do this work in the world that we live in today. Um, so what these are is a set of best practices for the successful implementation of projects. And like I said, it can be applied all over the world in different ecosystems, different types of environmental projects. Um, so this image here shows the five-step process. So first, you have to assess the situation on the ground. Um, secondly, you need to plan for how you're going to improve that situation. Step three is to implement the plan. Uh, step four, we analyze the data that we've collected and adapt as we need to. Um, and finally, step five is to share that plan and the results with the greater conservation community. Um, Additionally, a lot of organizations use a partner software, which is called Marathi, um, and that allows you to kind of share your information worldwide. It's basically a public database uh, where you can view other projects that are going on and their process. Um, so we didn't use that here because it's a software that you do have to pay for, and it's got a pretty steep learning curve to learn how to use the software. It's pretty complicated. So for our purposes, it wasn't useful. Um, but um, anyways, mainly we focused on steps one and two this summer. Um, that's what we've had time for so far. So I'll go a little bit more into detail on those. So step one, assess. You can see it circled here. It's typically one of the longest steps when you're using these conservation standards. Um, and this is because you're really setting up the groundwork here for, for the future for the rest of the project. <clears throat> so if we look at this first bullet point, um, our first step was to establish the purpose of the project and also the team that's going to be working on the project. So pretty quickly, we established that our, our purpose was to create a plan to monitor the restoration work that the urban ecology staff um, implements with the help of the citizen science volunteers. So our team was the staff members, uh, so the team being the research department and the land stewardship department, uh, but we also had a bunch of local experts that helped us with their, with their expertise where we had some knowledge gaps. Uh, moving on to bullet point number two, scope, vision, and target. This section was a little bit more complicated, a little bit more involved. Um, so up next, I'm gonna walk you through how we, how we accomplished the second, this second bullet point. So first of all, what is a scope? What does that mean? Uh, well, according to the conservation standards, a scope is basically just the broad geographic or thematic focus of a project. Um, and right off the bat, we knew that we did have some parameters we needed to follow. So in choosing the scope of our program first, or the, the scope of our project first, we needed to focus on the limited land that the UEC manages within Milwaukee, right? Um, 
since it's an urban location, there's not a lot of opportunities to expand our land. We've got a really limited amount that we're working with. <clears throat> Secondly, we wanted to start by focusing on just one eco ecosystem type um, at a time to avoid becoming overwhelmed with this entire process. So all of our parks contain a variety of ecosystems, prairies, wetlands, savannas, forests, woodlands, um, all types, and they're really all very different and they require different conservation planning approaches. Um, so it really wasn't realistic for us to focus on too many at a time. <clears throat> so thirdly, our ecosystem that we chose had to exist to varying degrees at each branch, each of the three UEC branches. Um, and this was so that we could compare progress over time. So after some discussion, we decided that we were gonna focus our plan on urban prairies uh, with the intention to add other ecosystems to the plan later on as, as we have the capacity. So with our scope defined, our next question was, how exactly do we define an urban prairie? And a, a quick Google search will tell you that an urban prairie is basically vacant land that's reverted back to green space and it's largely untended and unmanaged. So essentially you could call it an unused vacant lot or sometimes they call it fallow lands. Uh, so if any of you have ever walked through any of the prairie areas at the UEC parks, you'll realize pretty quickly that this is certainly not the case for the prairies that we're talking about here. Um, these are actively managed and they're really bustling with biodiversity. So as a group, we decided we wanted to put a more positive spin on the term within the conservation uh, and restoration communities and really give this new meaning through, through our work. So after uh, quite a lot of discussion and a few meetings, this is what we came up with. So first of all, our urban prairies are actively and intentionally managed, uh, like I mentioned before. There are also isolated patches of land that provide essential ecosystem services to mitigate the, mitigate the impacts of urban life on our local human populations in Milwaukee. So this is things like lessening the impacts of the heat island effect, providing carbon sequestration, groundwater filtration, recreation, and also mental, physical, and spiritual health, um, just to name a few of these ecosystem services. Now these prairies are subject to unique pressures, such as being completely surrounded by impermeable, impermeable surfaces. Uh, things like roads, highways, highways, sidewalks are all um, really surrounding our parks. <clears throat> They're also, like I mentioned, extremely limited in size and expansion opportunity. There's really high pollution levels because of the urban uh, location, um, heavy human presence, and a really high density of wildlife due to the fact that they're really the only habitat patch in the area. And this really forces the wildlife that is there to concentrate to one spot, um, one spot that's appropriate, often the, the habitat that the UEC is restoring. And this puts a lot of extra pressure on the ecosystem as a whole. So these were all things that we were thinking about that really define the urban prairies that we're working with within our scope. So next, uh, we identified and mapped out those designated areas at each branch. Uh, one of our team members made a map for us, and voila, we officially had our scope or our study area for our project. Up next, we had to identify our conservation targets. And this is just kind of, you know, jargon from, from the open standards, but a conservation, uh, a conservation target is defined as an element of biodiversity. So it could be species, a habitat, an ecological system, uh, or just an ecosystem at the project site that the project has chosen to focus on. And these species would really be the core of our project and all of the actions that we end up taking in the future are gonna be designed to improve the status of these specific targets within our parks. So all of these targets should really collectively represent the biodiversity um, at our site, so in our urban prairies. So just like we needed um, some parameters when we were establishing our scope, we also needed some parameters when we were finding and selecting our conservation targets. So first of all, we needed these species to be of interest to the public and the local community. So all of you who participate in our programming, uh, we want these species to be important to you in some way. Um, this is because much of the community science wildlife survey work that we conduct is really, it gets done with the help of citizen scientists. So we needed to make sure that these species are attractive to you, like I said before. Along this same vein, um, we needed to choose species that were easily identified 
um, by citizen scientists. So some types of species like beetles, they have so many subspecies that it's nearly impossible to identify them without first killing them and using a microscope. And we wanted to avoid that at all costs, right? We don't want to, to kill a species just so we can identify it um, because then it's not living in our ecosystem anymore and it can't contribute to the populations and it's not gonna be able to tell us anything important about the ecosystem's health, right? Um, so moving on to our next, our next parameter was that we wanted to make sure that our chosen species could function as ecosystem indicator species. So this means that we wanted them to tell us something about the health of the prairie. Uh, for example, maybe a certain butterfly species relies on a particular plant species for part of its life cycle. Um, so a lot of people think about the monarch butterflies and the milkweed, right? They require milkweed to reproduce. That's where the caterpillars um, are hatched from their eggs and that's what they eat when they're first kind of developing. Um, so if we do see, you know, a particular species of butterfly, this could indicate that it has the appropriate habitat, appropriate resources that it needs to survive and to thrive in the area. And this is a good thing, right? This means that our prairies are doing well um, and that we're on the right trajectory. So thirdly, we wanted to make sure that our species highlighted the interactions between the plant and the animal species. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, we want to know how these animals are using uh, the habitat that we've created so that we know where we need to make adjustments in the future. And finally, we wanted the breakdown of our species to be representative of roughly the biodiversity breakdown that you find in a typical prairie. Um, and the image on the right here shows about how the abundance of life is distributed in an average prairie. Um, you can see at the very bottom is invertebrates or the, uh, the arthropods, the insect species, are the most abundant, they're the biggest of the pyramid. And then moving up, you've got the plant species, which is a little bit of a smaller category. Vertebrates are the next largest category. So the things like um, snakes and small mammals, um, not as much biodiversity within prairies of those species. And then finally, birds um, make up the smallest portion of life in the prairie. So deciding which species to ultimately choose was really a balancing act between all of those parameters. Um, and in the end, because we were working across three branches that are each at different stages in the restoration and they each have um, different environmental histories to consider, we decided to create a list of a suite of species to look for um, to account for this variation instead of just choosing a couple specific species. And the idea here was that each branch will monitor for a variety of species that will tell us something about the ecosystem health, so indicator species, um, and the team will observe these and compare between branches over time. So we're still waiting on a little bit of uh, feedback from, from one of our experts, but for the most part, we've decided on the categories we wanna focus on. Those are um, from, from left to right, prairie birds, arthropods, the butler's garter snake, bumblebees, um, and finally, our last conservation target is the urban prairie itself. Um, so here's just a couple examples. We've got the grass skipper, the bobolink, rusty patched bumblebee, butler's garter snake, and um, the common red soldier beetle are just some of the species that make up our, our conservation targets, but I'll go into a little bit more detail um, next on the ones we chose. So uh, beginning with our suite of bird species, we selected some pretty iconic bird species to focus on for this project. Um, I already mentioned the bobolink, but we've also got the clay-colored sparrow, the dick sissel, which you can see in that image on the right, um, the meadowlark, and then there's a few others that we were thinking about. So the justification or reason why we included these birds in our plan is, is really a little bit complicated um, because research actually shows that birds are not a strong indicator of ecosystem health in prairies, and there's a few reasons for that. Um, first of all, birds don't rely on, on specific plants for their survival like, like some insect species do. They're more of generalists, so they don't, they don't really indicate a strong relationship between the floral and the faunal species, uh, just because they don't interact with their environment in that particular way. Like I said, they're more generalists. Um, additionally, birds don't play an essential role in seed transfer in prairies, uh, which was an idea that I kind of thought maybe was important, but it turns out birds aren't a huge role. Um, it's more ants and other insect species that transfer seeds across prairies. Um, and then finally, our prairie areas, um, our study areas are not really large enough to support nesting populations of these birds. Um, most bird species require um, a lot of acreage 
before they're going to nest in a location. Um, but with all of that being said, there's definitely still value in including these birds as indicators in our plan. While they may not choose to use our urban prairies as nesting sites, they might still use them as migratory stopovers. Um, and this is important data to gather as well, just citing these birds on bird walks or at other times in, um, during the, the season is gonna tell us that our habitat is good enough to attract these species. Up next is the arthropod species or the insects. And uh, like I mentioned, these are gonna be the largest category that we monitor and focus on. Uh, so, and that makes sense if you recall that pyramid that I showed a few minutes ago. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail about the specific indicator species we came up with because the list is pretty long, it's pretty detailed. Um, but I do wanna mention the categories or the, the families, the more broad families of arthropods that we are choosing from. So uh, before, before I do that, I should also mention that we're focusing on native species for all of our targets. So every category that I've mentioned so far, um, we're thinking about those native species. And this is especially important in thinking about arthropods because there are a lot of harmful invasive arthropods. So I already mentioned skippers. Um, these rely on specific grass species, and that's why they're an important indicator species. As many of you know, grasses are one of the prominent um, types of plants on, uh, within prairies, so very important to monitor these. Uh, but we're also choosing a grasshopper species to monitor for, um, and this is because there's not too many species native, of native grasshopper in Wisconsin, and they're all pretty distinct and they look different, and you can identify them pretty easily by just with your eye. Um, Additionally, grasshoppers are often predators, so many of them will eat other insects. And this is significant because if the grasshoppers are here, we know they have enough food, we know they're eating the bugs that we have, um, and they're able to survive, survive in the habitat that we've created for them. We're also looking for native ladybug species. Um, a lot of the ladybugs that we see in our day-to-day -day life are, are, are invasive species, so it's really interesting to find native ladybug species within our prairies. And we actually have already found a few um, when we've just been out there exploring. And then finally, beetles. Uh, and this one is trickier to identify because beetles are really one of the most abundant, abundant types of species in the world. Um, I've heard before that one in four living things or one in four uh, like animal species is a beetle. So there's an incredible amount of biodiversity there to choose from. Luckily for us, there is an awesome beetle expert who does surveys at all three branches during the summers, and her help's really been invaluable in identifying these species. So just to name a few, uh, we've got pictured here is the red milkweed beetle. Uh, we're also thinking about the cucumber beetle, the blister beetle, and there's a few more on our list that we're, um, that we're gonna be focusing on. On to the herptiles. Uh, for our herptile species, we chose only one species, and that's the butler's garter snake. And we chose that for, for a couple of reasons. So first of all, this snake has a pretty politically contentious history. Um, in 1997, it was listed on the Wisconsin Endangered and Threatened Species List. And the reason for this was um, the number of snakes was rapidly declining because of development pressures and habitat fragmentation. And so a position on this list means that landowners and development uh, developers often can't build where they want to if that listed species is found uh, on or near the property. So this was really prob problem problematic for um, you know, developers and things like that. So in 2013 or 2014, I can't remember which, the species was delisted, um, even though there's not exact data on if the status of the snake has improved. Um, so because of this, many people are familiar with the species or they're familiar with its cousin, the common garter snake, which is a little bit of a bigger snake. Um, and people tend to see it in their yards. Um, so public interest is definitely there for this species. And additionally, we already monitor for this species at uh, some of the branches. So there's a lot of data that we've already got established here. Uh, and then the last category that I'm gonna talk about is just our bumblebee species. Uh, so we've chosen four species of bumblebee to monitor for. I already mentioned the rusty patched bumblebee, but we've also got the yellow bumblebee, which is pictured here. We've got the half black bumblebee and the black and gold bumblebee. Um, so bumblebees, they're a good indicator of prairie health because they've got such strong relationships with native plant species. Um, they also play a huge role in pollination and they help the flowers grow and spread. Um, so they're very useful. 
there's a lot of public interest also surrounding bumblebees. And like a lot of the other uh, categories we've already talked about, the UEC um, already monitors for bumblebees during the, the summer field season. Okay, so let's refresh a bit. Um, we've got all of our conservation targets established. And if we look at the, the conservation stand standards model again, that next bullet point under step one assess is critical threats. So to really assess the situation and the context of our urban prairies, we had to do some research into what's threatening each of our conservation targets. So uh, first of all, the open standards define the threat as primarily human actions that result in the degradation of one or more conservation targets. So sometimes these threats are direct and sometimes they're indirect. Um, direct threats tend to be easier to identify. They're things like hunting or deforestation that uh, are really obvious. It's really obvious what their impact is on, on an animal species or a plant species. Um, indirect threats tend to be things that are a bit more outside of our control, um, things like policies and societal forces. <clears throat> and these are the things that drive the direct threats. So um, an example of this could be maybe the need for lumber and energy and income uh, could drive deforestation, right? That's the reason the deforestation is happening, which is impacting, you know, the forest, if the forest was our conservation target. So I'm not going to walk through all of the threats we identified, uh, once again, because there were a lot of them, but I do want to talk through some of the major ones. And um, obviously each threat is going to impact each target a bit differently, which further complicates this whole process. Um, and also many of these threats are going to be related and they compound upon each other, kind of worsening the situation if, if you don't address them. So the first main threat that I want to talk about is illegal harvesting. And this primarily is going to affect our butler's garter snakes, uh, some of the plants in the prairie, the flower species, uh, and bumblebees and arthropods for, for different reasons. So first of all, the butler's garter snake, as I mentioned earlier, or maybe I didn't mention this, but it's often uh, taken illegally from from its habitat, and this is to be sold as pets. And um, this is something that is, is relatively common and it's a pretty big threat to the butler's garter snake. And it directly impacts the number of snakes in the parks, uh, which as a result reduces the likelihood of successful reproduction. So our numbers are not gonna be growing if people keep taking snakes from the parks, right? Um, additionally, the harvesting of, of plant materials, it's actually illegal within Milwaukee County parks. So, uh, Picking the flowers and the plants from the prairies is it's not only illegal, but it's going to be detrimental to a lot of our species. It's going to affect the ability of our plants to reproduce if, if over harvesting happens. Um, and it's also going to affect those insect species and the bumblebees because it takes away valuable food and habitat. Um, so illegal harvesting is a pretty big problem in urban parks. Um, that next bullet point, invasive species is probably one that everyone knows pretty well. They're a, they're a pretty big problem, even in your own backyard, probably. Um, so they threaten the native plant um, diversity by competing for resources. Oftentimes they can push out the more vulnerable plant species because they can adapt to, to different situations better than those more sensitive native species. Um, <clears throat> invasive species can also impact bees, um, our bumblebees and our arthropod species. So. Um, honeybees are an invasive species and they, they're really one of the biggest competition for native bumblebees for, for resources and for food and habitat and things like that. The last threat that I want to talk about is disturbed soil. And soil can become disturbed in, in many ways really, um, but the ones I'm going to talk about are compaction and contamination. So this is mainly caused by people going where they're not supposed to be going. Um, and it may not always seem like a big deal, but it can have really big consequences for ecosystems and the environment. So for example, native plants, uh, like I mentioned, they have a harder time growing and establishing root systems in compacted soil. Um, invasive species, they have an easier time establishing themselves in this degraded soil. So they get this opportunity, they move in, they replace our desired native plant species. Um, and, and once again, we're out a lot of that valuable habitat and food for, for our native fauna. Um, so those are some of our, our major threats. After brainstorming these, these critical threats and the impacts of our target species, our next step, according to the conservation standards, was to build a situation model. Um, now, a situation model um, is a diagram that puts together all of the pieces of our research 
to visually show what we believe is happening in the parks. Um, a more technical definition, according to the conservation standards, is that it's a situation model, or is that a situation model represents the relationships between the key factors identified in a situation analysis believed to impact or lead to one or more conservation targets. So basically what this means is it's a logic model or a flow chart that shows how the team believes the threats are impacting the targets. So how are these threats affecting our species? <clears throat> and it also seeks to identify the larger forces that are causing these threats. So the idea with this was, was to create a model that's gonna allow us to identify intervention points where we can change the impact that those threats are having on our urban prairies and ultimately improve them. Um, so this step is really trying to get to those underlying causes. And after a lot of discussion and multiple iterations, here is what our team came up with for our situation model. Now, I don't expect you to absorb all of this information because it's very complicated and there's a lot here, but um, I'm just going to explain a few pieces so you can kind of interpret this a little bit better. So um, on the far right in green, we have those conservation targets. Um, I think you can see my mouse. So right here, these are our conservation targets. And then in gray are our stressors. And these are the impaired aspects of our conservation target um, as a result of human activity. So these are aspects that the animal or the species needs to survive that is somehow being degraded. Uh, moving over to the orange, these are our direct threats or the causes of the stressors, right? The things that are really uh, causing changes in the ability of our species to survive. And then finally, on the far left are the yellow, uh, the indirect threats. And these are the forces that are driving the direct threats. And then you can just see these arrows are kind of representing the causal relationships between the threats. Uh, so here I pulled out one of the chains of logic, just so I can explain it in a little more detail. Um, this is exactly pulled from that previous slide, that situation model. I just cleaned it up so it's a little bit easier to read. So the way you would interpret this, or the way that the logic works, uh, this time from left to right. So we'll start by saying, urban development in the city of Milwaukee is going to lead to an increased human presence. Uh, I lost my mouse. Increased human presence in our... Um, in our natural areas or near our natural areas. This is going to lead to an increase in recreation within our parks. Um, and in increased human behaviors right here, increased human behaviors that negatively impact the park. And that's what I've called this, this little box of three uh, yellow squares right here. They're human behavior threats. Um, and just to explain them a little bit from top to bottom, going off path, dumping of litter, so both biotic and abiotic materials, and off-leash dogs. And um, the way that they affect or damage the prairie system um, is going off path can result in, first of all, the trampling of vegetation uh, or the spreading of invasive seeds. A lot of times seeds will stick to your clothes. Uh, most people have had like burrs that stick to their clothes. Those come with you wherever you go unless you remove them, right? Um, so going off path can spread that. Um, off-leash dogs, can also contribute to both of these things. They can trample vegetation, seeds can stick to their fur, um, things like that. But they're also a pretty big threat to birds, right? The barking scares off the birds um, uh, and things like that. And then finally, litter. Um, it can be <clears throat> consumed directly by the animals or it can introduce diseases and pathogens into the environment. So um, overall, all of these um, direct and indirect threats here are gonna lead to a poorer poorer habitat quality, um, which is then going to negatively impact our urban prairies and all of the species that are living within that. So um, hopefully you can see how helpful it is to have this situation model and to use it to really get a picture of what's happening within our urban parks. Um, after this step, um, that first step, we were ready to go on to step two, plan. And this step consists of a few things, setting measurable goals for our targets, uh, choosing strategies to accomplish those goals, and building logic chains for our assumptions on how we think these strategies are going to work. Um, so this step is currently in progress uh, by the team. So I'm not gonna say too much about it right now, but I do wanna point out some of the strategies that we've selected to address our threats. Uh, so first of all, 
The conservation standards define a strategy, um, or I'll call it an action sometimes, or they're the same thing, um, as a set of activities with a common focus that work together to achieve specific goals and objectives by targeting key intervention points and optimizing opportunities. So typically strategies are divided into three main categories. Um, we've got stress reduction actions, which seek to lessen the impacts of the threats through direct management, direct land, um, land management generally. Below that, we've got behavioral change actions, and these seek to change how humans interact with the environment or the target species. And this is often by uh, raising awareness and you know, spreading education and things like that. And then finally, we've got enabling condition actions, which seek to increase the operational capacities and remove legal barriers um, and things like that. So most successful strategies are gonna use a suite of strategies from all of these little categories. So just to share a few of the strategies that um, the UEC is either already implementing or that we hope to implement in the future. Um, first of all, outreach and increased signage in the parks. We believe that a lot of the human behavior that happens in the parks is just a result of the lack of knowledge of the intricacies of ecosystems and the, and the consequences that this can have. So we think that if we address these knowledge gaps and influence people, um, we can get them to recreate responsibly and cause less damage on our ecosystems. Where that signage doesn't work, we're hoping that maybe trail maintenance and improvement will work. So uh, the second strategy here, we're, we're hoping that by creating and maintaining high quality trails, people will refrain from venturing off path. So um, other actions that are related to this include adding boundaries. Um, sometimes this is dense vegetation, fencing or brush piles along the sides of trails just to make it harder to go off paths uh, and discourage that type of behavior. And then the last one that I wanna talk about that I, that I find pretty interesting is um, using multiple seed sources during planting projects. And this was something that I hadn't thought about too much before talking with our land stewardship team. <clears throat> and so this is especially important when you're working in a small space with limited genetic material, right? Um, we need seeds from multiple sources so that we can grow our gene pool and give the plant populations um, kind of more, more strength, more resistance to disease. Um, we, want, we want seeds that are kind of adapted to different types of situations. <clears throat> So those are just a few of our conservation actions that we're taking to improve our urban prairies um, and the ability of our target species to thrive, just so that the people of Milwaukee can really continue to enjoy these natural spaces within the city. <clears throat> so like I said, it's a work in progress. We're still working on it, but, but hopefully after all this, you can, you can really see why adaptive management is, is a great tool and a great framework for conservation planning, uh, particularly in an urban context like uh, like the city of Milwaukee. All right, and thank you all for, for taking the time to listen to me. Um, if you've got any questions, I know I said I would pause in the middle. I'm sorry that I didn't, but I'm happy to take your questions now.